Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the story of the Napoleonic Wars. Thank you to everybody who helped me straighten out exactly where we are in the timeline with this Epic History TV series. So we're going to be picking up today with Napoleon's Spanish Ulcer, which is uh, Spain, 1809 to 1811. That's what we're going to be looking at as far as the story of the Napoleonic Wars goes. If you have not seen my reaction to this series that goes all the way back to uh, almost two years ago on this channel. There's a link in the description that'll take you back to the beginning. I've also put the link to the original content. Definitely check out Epic History TV. They have some fantastic stuff that covers a variety of historical topics and it's very well produced, very well uh, kind of uh, presented uh, in every way, shape and form. Greatly, uh, Great research, everything, top notch stuff. Let's go ahead and dive in. Hundred percent. Fairly, though, we should also give a little bit of credit to the Russian campaign. But yeah, Spain and Russia are the downfall of Napoleon. Absolutely. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, was at the height of his power. He had just won another crushing victory against Austria at Wagram, and imposed a humiliating peace treaty. But the war he'd started in Spain and Portugal, with his ill-judged invasion the previous year, continued to rage. And remember that Napoleon has gone, he, he was in Spain for a while dealing with this, but had to leave to go deal with Austria. And one of the ongoing issues that we have for Napoleon is he can't be everywhere at the same time. Napoleon had placed his own brother, Joseph, on the Spanish throne, uniting a proud country against him. His troops had dealt ruthlessly with popular uprisings, while routing a succession of Spanish armies. And I, I saw this said elsewhere yesterday. I was watching a documentary about the American Revolution. Uh, and this is absolutely the case in pretty much any conflict. When you are an invading force and you're dealing with an army of insurgency, in other words, your invading force is overwhelmingly more powerful than anything that can meet you in the field. But you have uh, like these partisans or these civilian soldiers who, who fight uh, kind of a non-traditional war. You are almost always going to lose the propaganda war, right? Because you have to resort to some pretty ruthless tactics to deal with something like that. So you saw that image of Napoleon's troops executing a civilian up against a wall. And those are the kinds of images that are going to be portrayed uh, to make the occupying force look as bad as possible. In February 1809, Marshal Lann overcame the heroic defence of Zaragoza in a brutal siege that cost 54,000 Spanish lives and 10,000 French. But still, the Spanish and Portuguese remained defiant. And three months after their escape from Coruña, the British were back. Here comes in April, Wellesley. Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon to lead a small Anglo-Portuguese army. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training, would soon prove themselves highly effective. So just uh, for clarification purposes for anybody who don't know, Wellesley, we know him better as the Duke of Wellington. That was his title, Duke of Wellington. His, his name was actually Arthur Wellesley. Three weeks after arriving in Portugal, Wellesley moved against Marshal Soult's second corps, which had recently taken Porto. Soult and his troops, preoccupied with plundering the region, had no warning of the British advance, and were soon in headlong retreat back through the mountains into Spain. In Porto, there's a pretty popular uh, football team there. Not then. Hmm. Having secured Portugal for the time being, Wellesley planned a joint campaign with General Cuesta, commanding the Spanish army of Extremadura. On the 10th of July, the two commanders met at Casas de Miravete to discuss strategy. Relations between these two allies were not straightforward, 
Spain and Britain had a long history of conflict. The Spanish were deeply suspicious of British intentions in Spain. Yeah, so let's talk about this. Okay, this is 1809, right? And uh, Spain was allied with the United States during the American Revolutionary War. So it's Spain, France, to a lesser degree, the Netherlands. Uh, and Britain has uh, this war with Spain. Spain, one of their primary goals is to get Gibraltar back, that southern tip of the uh, Iberian Peninsula that is kind of the opening there to the Mediterranean Sea that's to this day part of the British uh uh, the British Empire, the British, uh, not an empire anymore, but um, the British Commonwealth, and they still have troops stationed there. So, uh, yeah, so there's some bad blood between Spain uh, and England going back quite a ways. Uh, and, of course, England and France have been at war off and on for centuries now. While the British had a low opinion of the Spanish army, which they considered poorly trained and badly led. Wellesley's request to take over command of Spanish forces was rejected, but the generals agreed to a joint advance up the Tagus Valley towards Madrid, to be supported by General Venegas advancing from La Mancha. In the face of their advance, Marshal Victor's 1st Corps withdrew to Talavera, where he was joined by King Joseph and General Sebastiani's 4th Corps. The French plan was for Joseph's army to defend Madrid, while Marshal Soult led three corps down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. And remember, this being 1809, it's not like you, you can put a call in or send a, you know, a telegraph message and say, hey, I need you to move your sixth corps down here. You know, all of this stuff takes time. You know, communication is a long, difficult process, and you never really know 100% for sure if your messages are getting through until you get a response. Uh, and when you respond, you don't know if that got through. So there's so many things that can go wrong in here just with communication and coordination with all of these multiple pieces that are moving. But Joseph, worried by Salt's slow progress, and General Venegas's advance on Madrid decided to attack at Talavera. And why does that quote matter? 150 leagues from the sea, because of course the British sea power is their strength, right? One of the reasons Napoleon ends up going to war uh, with some of these nations is going to be over this British kind of cutting off of trade to Napoleon. Uh, it's the same thing that they're going to use in World War I, is cutting off the ability for the Germans to be able to trade with the world. So um, British troops cut off from their lifeline of supply and of escape if necessary. Napoleon feels pretty good about this. The Battle of Talavera saw British infantry bear the brunt of the French assault. They stood firm and repelled the enemy with disciplined musket fire and bayonet charges. Talavera was a small battle compared to the great clashes fought that year in Austria, but it proved that under Wellesley, Britain's small, well-drilled army was a force to be reckoned with, even though in the short term victory achieved little. Warned of Soult's approach from captured dispatches, the victorious Anglo-Spanish army retreated. While King Joseph and Fourth Corps marched against Venegas's army, which they smashed at the Battle of Almonacid. That autumn, the Supreme Junta in Sevilla, Free Spain's effective government, raised two new armies for another attempt to liberate Madrid planning to converge on the capital from north and south. But Wellesley, ennobled as Viscount Wellington for his victory at Talavera, had been so disgusted by the lack of Spanish cooperation that summer that he refused to risk his army. Predictably, Spain's inexperienced armies met with disaster. At Ocaña, they suffered their biggest defeat of the war, when a smaller force under Marshal Soult routed the Spanish army, taking 14,000 prisoners and 50 cannon. I, I said it 
before and I'll say it again. It's just amazing to me how many of these battles there are throughout this period of what we call the Napoleonic Wars. And granted, we're talking about better than a decade of time here. And so there's massive battles happening all over Europe. Uh, and there's so many incredible spots. I'm, I'm just curious to know how many of these battlefields are preserved if there's something to see. So our European followers, if you live in any of these places, whether it's Spain, France, Austria, Germany, Belgium, whatever it might be, do you live near any of these battlefields or have you visited any of these battlefields? Are there things to see and experience there? I'm curious. A week later, the army of the left was heavily defeated at Alba de Tormes. There was more bad news when Girona fell to the French after an epic seven-month siege. Mm. The Supreme Junta's plans to retake Madrid were in tatters, and southern Spain was now wide open to French attack. Yeah, the, the obvious question to ask here is when is it enough, right? I mean, when does Napoleon decide, when does France decide we've done enough? You know, we don't need to keep attacking. You know, we've got northern Spain. Do we really need to take southern Spain? But granted, if you're Joseph Bonaparte, I'm the king of this country and I need it all. I'm going to unite it all under me. Um, but in hindsight, it's always easy to say, when is it enough? Hmm. In January 1810, King Joseph marched south with an army of 60,000 men. Spanish resistance evaporated. Spain's supreme junta was overthrown in a coup as Cordoba and Sevilla fell without a fight. Joseph, who still hoped to win over the Spanish with his progressive reforms, was welcomed by many as a saviour from anarchy. Only Cadiz held out, its defences reinforced by a British naval squadron, and was besieged by Victor's first corps. Meanwhile, Napoleon sent Marshal Massena to Spain with 65,000 reinforcements. He was reckoned one of Napoleon's best marshals, and had just been made Prince of Essling for his heroics in the recent war against Austria. Massena was to lead a third French invasion of Portugal, take Lisbon and chase the British back into the sea. He laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo, a fortified city controlling one of the main routes into Portugal, which surrendered after two weeks' bombardment. Hmm. Wellington, with only 33,000 men, to face Massena's 50,000, retreated. Yeah. Uh... You don't want to make stupid attacks. You don't want to fight where the odds are against you. you. You know the best strategy is always to look for those opportunities where you have the advantage, whether it's advantage in knowledge of what's happening, advantage in manpower and arms, advantage in tactics. But here you're outnumbered two to one against one of Napoleon's best marshals. Not worth it. Massena crossed the Portuguese frontier and besieged Almeida. After just 13 hours of bombardment, wow. a lucky French shot hit the Portuguese magazine. 70 tons of gunpowder went mm. up in a devastating explosion that made all further resistance useless. It was a serious blow to Wellington, who'd been relying on Almeida's strong defences to buy him time. At Busaco, he found a strong defensive position and made a stand. So like we said, you, you look for the advantage. You fall back, you fall back, you fall back. If you can get a good defensive position, you can hang on against two to one odds, especially when the enemy's advancing deep into enemy territory. That means supply lines are gonna become an issue. So some of his men are gonna have to protect those supply lines, uh, are gonna have to be guarding his flanks, guarding his rear. He can't commit his entire force. Massena's uphill frontal attack failed at a cost of 4,000 casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, and his retreat continued. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely unexpected. Stretching across the Lisbon Peninsula, protecting the city from attack, 
they found a new chain of fortifications in two major lines. Known as the Lines of Torres Vedras, the British and Portuguese had been constructing these defences for more than a year. Now the line... This, this just shows one of the, the brilliances of people like Wellington. You're fighting a, a battle in the field, in the open, but you're also making plans, contingency plans, right? Hopefully we never need these defenses, but if we need them, they're going to be there and they're going to be ready. Some people might have looked at that and thought that's a year of a waste of time, but now we can see the wisdom of it. Planes bristled with more than 100 forts, redoubts and batteries, mm. manned by 30,000 troops and 250 guns. Massena soon discovered the lines were far too strong for him to attack. What's more, a scorched earth strategy had stripped the surrounding countryside of anything that might help the French. While Portuguese partisans attacked French supply columns as they struggled through the mountains to reach Massena's army. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Those the further the deeper you go into enemy territory, the more fragile your supply lines become and the more men you have to spare to guard those supply lines and, and so really what you need here against lisbon uh is a navy well there's the british strength right so they're going to be able to protect this side the reason why in a similar situation to this a few decades earlier you have lord cornwallis have to surrender at yorktown same deal right builds defenses back to the sea uh, you know, hoping for an escape by water in that case. The reason it doesn't happen is because the French fleet shows up at that time. Here, the British have the advantage with that, and so the French can't get at Lisbon by sea. Massena faced a grim predicament. Starved of supplies, too weak to attack, unwilling to retreat. But throughout this standoff, it was Portuguese peasants who suffered most of all. When their villages and farms were burned, many took refuge in Lisbon, where thousands died of starvation and disease. Back in France, Napoleon had been preoccupied with his divorce from the Empress Josephine, and then a new marriage to Archduchess Marie Louise, daughter of the Emperor of Austria. She was now expecting their first child. Nevertheless, from Paris, Napoleon sent frequent orders to his marshals in Spain and Portugal, urging them to take more aggressive action. And I should mention here that while Napoleon's legitimate line of descent uh, through his Austrian wife doesn't really go too far, I mean, his, his child dies pretty young, uh, Napoleon does have other descendants. He has illegitimate children that live, and we've got photos of, and they look just like him. It's pretty crazy. But when these orders arrived weeks later, they were usually out of date and showed little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. He now ordered Soult, based in Andalusia, to go on the offensive to draw enemy forces away from Lisbon, so Massena could take the city. Soult laid siege to Badajoz, a fortified city that controlled the southern route into Portugal. When 12,000 men of the army of Extremadura marched to its relief, they were routed by Soult, after which the city tamely surrendered giving up 8,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores. It was another heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. But remarkably, despite such disasters and their many blundering generals, the Spanish troops remained willing to fight, the courage of the rank and file undimmed. Victor's first corps, besieging Cadiz, had now been so weakened to support other operations that the Anglo-Spanish garrison decided to attack. The Allies landed along the coast to strike at the French siege lines from the rear. But they were ambushed by the French at Barossa. Despite heavy losses, the Anglo-Portuguese rearguard fought off the enemy, but a furious falling out between British commander Sir Thomas Graham and his Spanish counterpart General La Peña threw away any advantage. 
So same kind of thing that we saw with Arthur Wellesley and the Portuguese. The real problems here with the British and the Portuguese getting along and having being on the same uh, page with everything. And that's one of the challenges that these allies face when taking on Napoleon. Napoleon's the man, right? He is controlling all of this on his side, whereas the, the side that's opposing him is this collection of generals and emperors uh, from various nations, each with their own competing agendas, each with their own level of competence, uh, and, and therefore having different ideas about what should be done and how. And it's only when they can really start to coordinate and work together for a common cause that they can really start to make a difference. If, if all of them had been under one person from the beginning, if there had been an Eisenhower, for example, that oversaw the entire coalition against Napoleon, uh, things probably happen a lot differently. Soult, alarmed at these developments, marched back to Andalusia. Meanwhile, Massena, out of food and with no prospect of reinforcement, had no option but to retreat. Wellington's army pursued, discovering evidence of several appalling atrocities committed by the French against Portuguese villagers. There were running battles with the French rearguard, brilliantly commanded by Marshal Ney, until he was sacked by Massena for criticising his leadership. Hmm. Interesting, Having... because we haven't seen the last of Marshal Ney, and I kind of know how the story ends, but uh, interesting to see that happen. Um, so, again, you see who Wellington is here, right? Once the threat is clear, he doesn't just sit on his laurels. He just doesn't just say, okay, fine, we got rid of him, we're good. He pursues, because he knows he's got a weakened enemy who is short on supply, who's deep in enemy lines. There's an opportunity here to strike at them and really hit them while they're down. And chased the French out of Portugal, Wellington besieged Almeida. Massena's army now rested and reinforced, marched to its aid. The two armies clashed again at Fuentes de Onuro. In two days of heavy fighting, Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. The fortress fell the next week, but to Wellington's fury, British bungling allowed most of the French garrison to escape. Massena had lost 25,000 men in Portugal. Now he'd lost Almeida too, and a string of bad decisions, not least to bring his mistress with him on campaign, had cost him the respect of his officers. Yeah, that doesn't go well. It also means there's a significant distraction from you focusing on things as you should. Um, and, and it shows a little bit of a thin skin on his part that he removed another marshal for criticizing him, uh, especially someone as highly regarded as Marshal Ney had been. Um, so 25,000, we're talking almost half of his army he loses there. The Marshal, whom Napoleon had once nicknamed the Dear Child of Victory, was recalled to France in disgrace, never to hold senior command again. Napoleon sent Marshal Marmont to replace him. Meanwhile, Marshal Beresford, the British commander of Portugal's army, was sent to retake Badajoz with 20,000 British and Portuguese troops. When Soult approached with a relief force, Beresford marched to meet him at Albuera. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war, around 6,000 casualties on each side, with more than a third of the British infantry killed, wounded or captured. Marshal Soult declared, there is no beating these troops, in spite of their generals. I always thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their center, and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. Soult had been checked. So, that should tell you something, right? I mean, we've decisively defeated them on the battlefield. They're poorly led but they still keep fighting. You can't beat people who don't know when they're beat and are willing to fight to the last man and keep on fighting anyway. It's, that should tell you that what you're up against in Spain. 
but he was determined to save Badajoz. The newly arrived Marshal Marmont marched to his aid, and they advanced again. This combined army forced the British to abandon the siege. But when Wellington withdrew to a strong defensive position across the Portuguese border, Soult and Marmont did not pursue. French commanders in Spain had learned grudging respect for Wellington, and for the steadiness of his troops. For now, the war in Spain had entered stalemate. Hmm. Interesting. French barracks graffiti, I like that. While British, French and Spanish armies crisscrossed Spain and Portugal, another war was fought every day in the mountains, hills and woods. From 1808, Spanish and Portuguese civilians, militias and ex-soldiers began taking up arms against the hated French invader. They waged a war of ambushes and hit-and-run raids, known in Spanish as La Guerrilla, the Little War. Guerrilla War. There you go. I mean, and, and this is, you know, the U.S. in Vietnam. This is the Soviets in Afghanistan. This is so many wars in history where a large, huge power is trying to take on... Uh, a country that just will not be defeated. Its fighters became known in English as guerrillas. Britain's Royal Navy supplied vital weapons, stores and money, often landing them behind enemy lines. Much of Spain's rugged countryside fell under the control of the guerrillas. North of Madrid, Juan Martín Diez, an ex-soldier known as El Empecinado, the stubborn, led a guerrilla band 6,000 strong. In Navarre, Esposimina, a former peasant, ran a highly organised band that caused havoc for the French, capturing convoys and couriers on the strategic burgos Bayon road, and branding Viva Mina on the forehead of collaborators. Mm. While in the west, Julian Sanchez, known as El Charo, led the self-styled Lanceros de Castilla. El Charo himself wore a French hussar's cap, its eagle symbolically turned upside down. There were dozens more bands operating across Spain, though a few were no better than bandits, terrorising civilians as often as the enemy. Mm. The guerrilla war was merciless, marked by hideous atrocities on both sides. A French soldier's greatest fear was to be taken alive by the guerrillas, who often tortured their prisoners before killing them. Tens of thousands of French troops were tied down by this people's war, guarding outposts or patrolling the countryside. Yeah, this is what you have to do, and this is why you fight a war like that, is because it's not a pitched army in the field that you can just you know, have a, a pitch battle against and, and fight and defeat. You, you've got little things all over the place, which means you have to spread out all over the place to deal with it and fragment yourself, and it removes the power of a large army. The roads were so dangerous for French messengers that they required cavalry escorts of 200 men or more. Many still didn't get through. Their valuable dispatches forwarded to Wellington, for whom they became an invaluable source of intelligence. The war in Spain would ultimately cost the lives of 240,000 French mm. soldiers. As was typical in wars of this era, most died from disease. But more died fighting guerrillas than in battle against the British. Look at that. 70, almost 77,000 dead fighting in guerrilla war. That is a huge, huge number. You can't replace these numbers. And Spanish and what armies. did you gain? Nothing. However, it was the twin threat, a well-led regular army under Wellington and a popular insurgency that left the French facing an impossible strategic dilemma. 
If their armies remained dispersed to fight the guerrillas, Wellington could attack. But if they concentrated to defeat Wellington in battle, huge swathes of the country would quickly fall to the guerrillas. Impossible. This was Napoleon's Vietnam, or his bleeding ulcer, as he called it. A war that cost his empire an average of 100 casualties every day, hmm. with little prospect of victory. And in 1812, as Napoleon launched his gigantic invasion of Russia, Wellington and the guerrillas launched their own offensive that would turn the war in Spain on its head. Now, the one thing we should mention, of course, is that the British are going to have their own issue to deal with because in 1812 they're going to go to war with the United States. And so, you know, they're going to have to kind of deal with that across the ocean while they're also dealing with Napoleon at the same time. But they can kind of handle that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is why I say all the time, I think sometimes we overemphasize Waterloo as being Napoleon's defeat because Napoleon was defeated long before Waterloo. Waterloo was just the end. Waterloo wasn't where it happened. It, it had already been decided. If it hadn't been Waterloo, there would have been another Waterloo and another Waterloo until he'd been defeated. He was defeated in Spain and in Russia. 1812 is really where you see the major turning point of his downfall. Spain's wrapping up and going badly. He's about to start Russia. The writing's on the wall. But uh, like I said, this is a topic I am still learning about myself. So I would love to hear your input. If this is something you know a lot about, add to the conversation. Let's learn together. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for watching.